welcome back friends. In the previous lecture, we had introduced you to the various concepts in uh, capacity and speed calculations of bus and rail transit. Uh, in this lecture, what we are going to do is show you some solved examples uh, of uh, uh, capacity and uh, of capacity basically of rail and, uh, and rail and bus transport so that uh, this will help you uh, understand those theoretical concepts that you have already learned in the previous lecture. Uh, so, uh, we are going to give you one example each how to determine bus capacity and rail capacity and uh, mostly what you will see are uh, uh, empirical formulas that are used in understanding or in calculating these uh, uh, problems. So, you do not have to worry about memorizing these formulas, but understand the concept of what are the different inputs that are needed in these calculations and if you understand those, uh, the rest is pretty simple. So, uh, if we start with the first problem uh, where we are trying to de uh, de uh, determine the uh, bus stop capacity. So, as you see finally, what we need to determine is the bus stop capacity. So, say Kolkata which is a central city in eastern India is examining opportunities to improve transit service uh, through its downtown core as part of a downtown circulation plan. Uh, existing bus service to the downtown is concentrated on say a street X which is a one way route uh, just over about 5 kilometers in length and has 4 bus stops. Okay. Uh, it has 2 through lanes uh, with on street parking provided on both sides of the street. The route is served by 6 different transit routes. Okay. So, uh, along this 5 kilometer stretch uh, there are 6 different transit routes operated by say a fictitious agency called Kolkata City Transit uh, with combined peak hour frequency of 26 buses per hour that is a combined frequency of all the 6 routes combined. Buses stop every block with an average block length of 1.2 kilometers. On street parking is removed at bus stops to allow buses to access the curb and buses must exit the traffic stream to serve the passengers. Traffic signals are located at each intersection along the downtown street. So, this gives you the understanding of the existing situation. Right. So, any this is a common existence in any of the cities, towns where you may have a bus route or a bus network or a bus system. Uh, you will have certain bus uh, routes, certain overlapping bus routes, they will have uh, certain bu designated bus stops, they may or may not have uh, on street parking right? uh, and traffic signals may or may not be there. So, in this case everything is given to you and what you are asked to calculate is first calculate the average dwell time second calculate the loading area capacity and finally using all these using these two calculate the bus stop capacity right and we have learnt about all these theoretical concepts in the previous lectures so just look, go back and look at the uh, definitions of all of this and then you will follow through uh, the example problems so now let let us first look at the inputs that will be needed uh, to calculate each of these three uh, uh, parameters so, inputs needed to the problems are say, so we have we know that with there are 4 stops along that line. So, for each of the stops what you will need is average boarding volume per bus, average alighting volume per bus, how many boarding doors are there or where they are there, right? are they in the front or is boarding allowed only in from through the front door or back doors or both doors. So, where are the boarding doors? What is the uh, fair payment method? Uh, is it exact change only right or is it uh, uh, say for example, smart card, is it uh, a single ticket token? So, what is it? What type of fare collection uh, is uh, operating in your bus system that you have to know? Uh, boarding height, whether your platform is at level with the bus, uh, uh, bus landing or is there a difference? Uh, standees present or absent? So, do you allow standees on the bus or not or only sitting is allowed? Number of doors, available door channels. So, door channels meaning if it is a, a two door uh, that opens into uh, the bus, then the two door uh, will have two channels. Although it will be considered as one, uh, uh, one boarding gate or boarding door, but it, it will have two panels. right? So, if two panels open up that means two rows are formed. So, it is one door, but now there are two channels. Right. So, that is what is known as channels. Percentage of boarders using fare box. 
uh, there may be some person lot of persons who have uh, daily passes or uh, they don't need tickets so there will be only a portion of them who will need tickets so what is the percentage of people who actually uses the fare box that is in the uh, bus now you would be th thinking that uh, uh, realistically in uh, many of our or most of our buses there is no fare box kind of a system but think about it as a these modern uh, pos machines right pause machines so there may be pause machines through which you can buy a ticket there may be if you have a pass then you just show a pass uh, if you are a student, if you are a elderly citizen uh, say for example maybe the bus ride is free for you uh, if you are a woman uh, in delhi uh, maybe the bus ride is free for you so all of those factors act uh, in this calculation of the uh, dwelling time uh, at a stop right so you understand you remember what is a dwelling time dwelling time is the amount of time a bus uh, is stationary at a stop to pick up and drop off passengers right so all of these factors all of these factors that we are talking about goes into the calculation they are all inputs so they go into the calculation of the dwelling time last two ones are uh, door opening and closing time so there may be some few seconds uh, that go into the door opening and closing and the number of loading areas so remember uh, a bus stop may have only one loading area or it may have sometimes two loading areas back to back right so there may be one or two loading areas so these are all the inputs that are needed then you will have some default values that you can use right these default values have been developed by looking at various bus systems across the world so these are average values or best values or best practices values whatever they are they are some kind of default values which will allow you to at least get started with understanding what uh, how your bus system capacity works or what is the dwelling time so there are some of these uh, fare payment types uh, times right so these are uh, uh, number of uh, people uh, number of seconds per person right as seconds per person uh, how much uh, how much time uh, is needed to process the payment of one person or one passenger who is uh, uh, entering the um, uh, who is uh, boarding the bus right so seconds per person or seconds per passenger <coughs> whatever you may think so uh, you will see there are different types of different times that are uh, given as default values so based on what type of fare payment method your bus system uh, uh, is operating on you may assume or you may select any one of these two values right so alighting times are also some standard values for alighting times are also given these are fare payment times uh, and these are alighting times okay so this is what some standard values like i said these are all empirical studies that have been uh, uh, that have been done across the world and these values or this formulas also that you will see they are all developed based on these empirical studies that have been carried out so first what you would not uh, first what you would like to do is you will have to calculate the number of boarding and alighting passengers through each door channel right so remember it's not the door but the door channels if like we discussed one door has two panels that may, may create two channels right so in order to do so i'll just go through uh, the calculation for one stop and you may uh, you may do the similar calculations for all the other stops but anyhow the answers are shown here just uh, follow through these answers so if you want to calculate for example what is called pb1 which is the boarding passengers through door channel 1 okay so what you have to do is average boarding volume per bus multiplied by the percentage of boarders using fare box okay so now these two values are already been given to you as input parameters for example average boarding volume per bus in stop 1 you know as average boarding volume uh, volume per bus is 3 in stop 1 so there are three people on an average that board uh, or this bus from stop number 1 so you multiply that by the percentage of boarders using fare box so the percentage of boarders using fare box again we are it has already been given here which is 45% so if you multiply 3 times 0.45 what you will get is 1.4 right so you do all those for uh, for every other for every other stop uh, you will see some of the stops have uh, zero values or no values that is because no passenger is allowed to board through uh, through door channel 3 or no passenger is allowed to alight through door channel 1 so there may be some restrictions 
So if there is nobody allowed to board or alight through one of those door channels, then there is, uh, there is no uh, in the calculation of the number of people boarding or alighting, that value will be 0. Okay? Uh, simple enough. Uh, in similarly, while doing it, while calculating the uh, number of uh, passengers alighting through door channels uh, 1, well 1 values are 0. So, if you do it for door channel 2 for bus stop 1, all you need to do is average alighting volume per bus times 0.25. Now, again 0.25 is a standard uh, number that is assumed for alighting right? and those alighting uh, those uh, alighting times are given here. These alighting times, uh, average alighting volume, you know the average alighting volume, right? You know the average alighting volume. So, multiply the average alighting volume by 0.25, you will get these numbers. And if you just want to do the next number, so PA3, so average alighting uh, through door channel 3, because you know the total average alighting volume, you that is you know 3, so 3 minus 0.8 essentially is 2.3. So, I think it is rounded off to the one decimal that is why it, it has to be 2. Point, uh, I think this 0 0.8 is 0 0.75 or something like that. Uh, so, they are rounded off. So, do not worry about the rounding off. So, these are simple calculations for the first step which you have to calculate uh, to determine the number of boarding and alighting passengers through each door channel. Next, you have to calculate the boarding and alighting times through each channel. right? Now, you know how many people are boarding and alighting through one channel. Now, you, you need to know the time that people are uh, using to board or alight. So, again similarly all the calculations for all the four stops are shown. Let me just take you through uh, one stop. So, if you have to calculate T B 1 that is the average boarding service time for door channel uh, number 1, all you need to do is time taken for fair, uh, fair payment exact change is equal to 4.5 seconds no alighting through board. So, this is the time taken to board through channel 1 as there is no uh, alighting uh, allowed through channel 1. So, it will be only the time that is needed by people to board and we already know that that or we know that that time is equal to the time taken for fair payment in case of exact change. So, this since we have already shown that uh, uh, these are uh, using exact change. So, as in case of exact change here, in case of exact change right here, we know that the time taken for exact change is 4.5 seconds. So, time taken average boarding service time through channel number 1 for stop 1 is 4.5 seconds. So, it is as simple as that. Uh, if in case for channel number 2, for example, where both boarding and alighting are allowed, right? These are uh, door channel number two, where both boarding and alighting time are allowed. You have to multiply this time taken for visual inspection into 1.2, right? Because now you are visually inspecting who is boarding, who is alighting, so that adds a little bit of time to it. So you you know what is the time taken for visual inspection? That is two seconds, per, two seconds per, per per passenger. You multiply that by 1.2 right? and you will know uh, what is the time taken. After you have calculated now this time taken for boarding and alighting, next what you have to do is uh, you have to calculate the passenger flow time through each of the door channels. Now, you know the number of passengers, right? you have calculated the boarding uh, number of passengers and you have calculated the average boarding service time. Now, you have to know the passenger flow time. So, all you have to do is for passenger flow time is you have to multiply the number of passengers boarding through each channel times the number of uh, times the time taken for them to board and you have to sum all of those for all the different channels that are available. So, it is just a summation of uh, the product of P A times T A. Okay? Uh, so, whatever uh, if you do t so t is equal to a to n so how many our uh, more how many our channels are there you develop the product of it and sum it okay that will give you each of these values so that gives you the passenger flow for each of the door channels 
now you know the passenger flow through each of the door channels in order to determine the your first answer which is average dwell time now you have to all you have to calculate is you already know the passenger flow which you have calculated in the last last one uh, boarding loss time is something uh, that uh, again is a standard value that are given if the if there are only uh, one loading area uh, there is no loss if there are two loading areas there is a two second loss uh, because you know if there are two loading areas back to back so the bus that is coming behind uh, sometimes faces a little bit of delay if the fr the bus in front is not parked properly so there will be a slight delay if there are two loading areas so stop 3 and stop 4 has two loading areas so that's kind of a uh, boarding loss time and already the door opening and closing times are given to you as standards here uh, door opening and closing times right here so you take these two times uh, two uh, time factors and you uh, take the and you already know the maximum passenger passenger flow time then you add up all the three times if you add up all the three times this tells you that this much time is needed to process the passengers boarding and alighting because there will be uh, people paying tickets ticket fares and so on and so forth so that gives you the total time needed for that this gives you the boarding loss time in case there are loading areas multiple loading areas and this gives you the door opening and closing time so that will give you the average dwell time for each of the stops right so that solves the our first problem for the next problem which you have to calculate the loading area capacity again there are a bunch of inputs that are needed and these inputs are shown here again uh, inputs are um, green time ratio now loading area capacity depends uh, is, uh, is is influenced by if the bus stop is near the intersection then the green time green signal at the intersection affects the loading area capacity so you have to know the green time ratio the traffic signal cycle lengths what type of uh, stop it is is it in uh, uh, online or does it have a bus bay and so on and so forth which area it is is it in a cbd non cbd uh, or some other type of area a residential area so on so on and so forth you have to know the uh, which area the bus is in bus stop is in then you have to know uh, the curb lane traffic volume the curb lane only right if there are multiple lanes all you have to know is the traffic volume on the curb side lane uh, the right turning volume in our case the left turning volume that's because uh, we have free left so those vehicles turning left may affect uh, the uh, uh, the loading area capacity of the buses uh, so this since this uh, example is taken from a example uh, rear example in the united states they have right turning volume uh, conflicts we have left turning volume co conflicts so in our case this will be left turning volume uh, conflicting pedestrian volume so at the intersection there may be pedestrians who are trying to cross and the bus is also trying to go through so there or turn left so there may be some conflicts there that uh, arrival types of the buses do they arrive in a platoon on uh, together bunched or do they arrive in a random fashion number of physical loading areas which you already know loading area design and the bus lane type all these have to be input parameters have to be known some of these input parameters will have standard values which will come along with these known parameters and once you know that you can uh, start uh, calculating this in the first step in calculation of loading area capacity is the calculation of the clearance time so in calculation of a clearance time you need to calculate three different uh, um, uh, parameters one is the re-entry movement capacity re-entry delay and the other is a queue service delay now don't get caught up in the complexity of the formulas the formulas are very empirical they are uh, each of the values for each of them are given all you have to understand is what is happening in this case right since you are trying to calculate the loading area capacity the loading areas may be one or two so what the loading area capacity depends upon is the re-entry movement capacity so since these buses are stopped at the loading area if they cannot re-enter the traffic lane then the next bus cannot come into the loading area so the re-entry movement capacity affects the uh, capacity of the loading area a re-entry delay so from capacity you can calculate the delay right and then queue service delay so now if there are queues formed for of buses that are wanting to come into the loading area 
those queue so the uh, the queue service delay uh, the uh, delay due to the queuing system for these buses is also calculated in order to determine the clearance time that is the first thing uh, in understanding uh, or in calculation of loading area capacity again these are all shown for four different stops let us uh, go through uh, one of these stops and say that uh, re-entry movement capacity so the first calculation of re-entry movement capacity only uh, depends upon uh, your uh, uh, volume of vehicle on the uh, uh, on the uh, uh, what you call the curve lane volume of cap, uh, volume of traffic uh, traffic volume on the curve lane vcl right vcl times uh, e to the power minus vcl into tch tch is nothing but the critical headway for re-entry movements again standard values are given there right uh, uh, this is uh, uh, re-entry in seconds so you have to convert it into uh, hours i guess and then divided by 1 minus vcl times tf tf is the follow up uh, time for re-entry movement again that is given so you just enter those values you get the re-enter uh, re-entry movement capacity from the capacity you can calculate the delay uh, all the terminologies are already ex uh, explained here these are nla is the number of lanes and everything CRE is something that you already calculated here. You insert those values, you get a re-entry delay, and from the re-entry delay, what you uh, uh, from the re-entry delay, what uh, uh, you need to calculate after the re-entry delay, what you need to calculate is Q service delay. Again, Q service delay depends upon QR, which is the Q size at the end of the effective red time. So there may be uh, the signal uh, has a has a red time uh, even after the red time. Uh, there are n number of people that are, n number of vehicles that are queued up that means the green time was not able to service all these vehicles so there was a queue formed so that queue service delay here is calculated again you see the g by c ratio uh, you already know the green time ratio right here uh, you know the capacity you know the uh, volume uh, you know the volume the curve side lane so all of these are already known you calculate these so you know now you have calculated your uh, re-entry uh, capacity, you have calculated re-entry delay, now you have calculated your uh, queue service delay. Uh, there is uh, something called a, a re-entry delay for uh, case 3, where case 3 is influenced by the signal nearer the far side. So, it is an, again an assumption whether it is influenced or not uh, and standard values are again given here. You assume those. Uh, startup time, uh, time needed to uh, uh, if you are stuck in the queue and you want to start, uh, start back up, those are standard values that have to be inserted in and then clearance time is nothing but your TSU plus delay terms. So, TSU plus delay. So, you add up these and you get your, or you add up these two, you get your clearance time values. So, now that you have your clearance time, uh, your bus stop capacity calculations can begin. Uh, for, if before you do your bus stop capacity, you are, we are doing your loading area capacity. So, loading area capacity, uh, you bring in all these uh, uh, input values that are already being calculated, green time ratio, you know, coefficient of variation of dwelling times, you know the uh, dwell times from numerical 1. So, you bring them in here, uh, you calculate what are the, uh, what is the coefficient of variation in each of those dwelling times and you put it in there, right. You know how to calculate the coefficient of variance. Uh, 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 of, of, of any uh, given data set. Uh, then uh, along with that, you know what is the failure rate. Uh, failure rate, a standard failure rate can be, uh, can be assumed here as well. Uh, failure rate meaning uh, every time the bus is unable to uh, get uh, re-enter back into the stream. So, there may be certain percentage of time because of the queuing, because of the queues formed on the, uh, on the travel lane, it is not able to uh, re-enter. So, you can calculate the failure rate and from the failure rate you can do the corresponding say that the failure rates are normally distributed then you can calculate the corresponding standard normal variables uh, for the failure rate uh, so 15 percent times it fails that means 85 percent of the times uh, it is able to get in so uh, for a normal for a standard normal if you go and look at the z curve what is called the z curve uh, then you can find these normal values of uh, uh, 1.04 in case of 25 percent there will be 75 percent times it is able to enter. So, that values will be different. So, you know all of those. Uh, operating margins are something uh, that are uh, standard 
let me see if I am able to give it here. Um, those are operating margins are also uh, okay. Operating margin calculations is given here. So, operating margin calculation is nothing but the coefficient of uh, variance in dwell times multiplied by the standard normal multiplied by T d where T d is the average dwelling time which you have already calculated in problem 1. So, if you just multiply those you will get the operating uh, operating margin and then you know from the operating margin you can calculate the loading area capacity with this formula. Again this is G by C ratio you already know T c you already have have been given uh, T d you have already calculated uh, G by C you know T o m is the operating margin that you have calculated. So, using that you develop the loading area capacity. So, now you have calculated dwell time, you have calculated loading area capacity. Based on this loading area capac capacity you can determine what are the number of effective loading areas. So, if you have one loading area the efficiency is usually 100 percent. So, effective loading areas are 1. If you have two loading areas uh, the efficiency is 75 percent. So, the cumulative effect is 1.75. So, these are again standard tables that are available for you for online loading areas versus offline loading areas. So, you can uh, input those values again. Why are, why are we inputting those values? Because finally, we want to calculate the bus stop capacity. Lot of the, uh, all of these calculations in bus stop capacity are already many of them have already been developed uh, because we are going sequentially from one problem to the other problem. right? So, you know already what is the curb lane traffic volume, you know the right turn uh, lane volume, in our case the left turn lane volume, pedestrian volume you already know, arrival type you already know, stop location has been determined, uh, TOM we just calculated, loading area design we just calculated, right? effective loading areas also we know. Now, in order to calculate the bus stop location factor FL, bus stop location factor again is given by a standard uh, table. Uh, these standard tables uh, tell you that uh, if it is uh, 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 a lane use, uh, a lane type versus bus stop location, if it is a near side type 1, then you can use this one. If it is a near side type 2, then you can use these values. So, uh, we, all uh, we all put in whatever uh, um, value it is. That means, this is a far side lane type 2 bus stop, which is on the far side, located on the far side of the intersection. So, 0.5 has been used. Uh, curb lane uh, capacity, curb lane volume we know we can develop curb lane capacity. Uh, traffic blockage adjustment factor again these are standard values uh, that can be calculated or that is usually given to you. Uh, what is a, a traffic blockage adjustment factor again it depends upon whether uh, the queuing buses are blocking the traffic behind them. right? So, if the loading areas they are not able to get into the loading areas they are queued up and they are queued up into the traffic lane. So, then the traffic is not able to move. So, that is the traffic blockage ad adjustment factor. So, if you know certain uh, if you know these standard values uh, this one standard value in this case and this one from the table right here you can calculate the bus stop capacity. The bus stop capacity is given by uh, a multiplication of these three factors uh, NEL. Uh, NEL is the number of effective loading areas you already know, know that FTB uh, FTB is the traffic blockage factor standard you have already calculated that and BL, BL is the is given by this factor uh, which which which, uh, uh, which you have already calculated in the previous step that is the loading area design capacity. Loading area design capacity we already just calculated here. So, that is the same one here. So, you may develop the bus stop capacity. So, now you know that this stop number 1 can process 47 buses per hour whereas, uh, stop number 2 can only process 36 buses per hour. So, that gives you the understanding of how your bus stops are uh, able to handle your bus frequency uh, that you have scheduled for the entire route. right? So, that is an example of uh, bus stop capacity. Uh, similarly, we will go through quickly an example of uh, how to calculate the capacity of uh, a rail transit line. In order to do so, what you need to know is the minimum train separation, the controlling headway because headway remember headway is what determines usually what capacity your uh, trains are running at and the resultant line and person capacity. 
So, line capacity uh, is different than person capacity because line capacity meaning how many uh, train coaches you have and in one line uh, how many trains run every hour so that gives you the entire line capacity whereas, a uh, person capacity is how many people actually are running on the line uh, whether there are fewer than line capacity or more than line capacity uh, or coach capacity. So, all that gives you the uh, capacity of your uh, transit of your uh, transit rail line. So, in case of metro line or suburban train line uh, if you want to calculate mostly for uh, heavy rail transit line right. So, if you first one if you again similarly we will go through different uh, uh, input parameters minimum train separation if you want to calculate there are a lot of uh, parameters that you need to get into you can look at each of these we will have we have already given you the uh, reference link at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, all of these this uh, solved problems are solved there as well. Uh, so, uh, go through that similarly you already know the concept by which we are telling you how to calculate these uh, given sets of parameters will be there their default values will be there all you need to do is take the empirical formula you need to know which empirical formula to pick uh, which of the variables which of the constant uh, values to pick and you have to uh, pick them insert them into the right formula in order to get the answer. So, uh, understand all of these quickly longest uh, uh, train length you have to know uh, uh, maximum line speed you have to know approach speed right uh, for similarly uh, the others acceleration deceleration speed uh, braking uh, braking time uh, whether the uh, station is at grade or is there any incline or decline into the station. So, all of these uh, values are given here for uh, uh, for uh, different types of signaling systems right. Uh, this is something that is uh, that you have to determine what type of uh, control system you have for your uh, rail line and for different types of systems there will be different uh, parameter values that will be uh, that you would need to uh, insert. Uh, so, again these parameter specific control systems are given here uh, safety factors uh, for this type of control system the value is this much whereas, uh, for a cap signal type uh, the value is this much. So, you need to know uh, which one to pick based on uh, what you have uh, what type of system you are uh, developing and finally, the minimum train control separation is what you are trying to uh, find out and it is given by this uh, empirical formula. Uh, like I said again in the case of bus do not get intimidated by the length of the formula they are not very complex each of those values are already the values have already been given as input parameters just go through each of these table each of these input parameters here uh, and also the input parameters uh, these these you have to calculate, but these input parameters right here insert them for each type of um, uh, control system. So, this is one type this is the other type. So, insert uh, the parameters as per the control systems and you will get you will calculate what is called a minimum trail control separation. Once you know the minimum train, uh, train control separation the next step or the second problem if you remember now you have calculated minimum train control separation the next is the controlling headway. Now, in order to calculate controlling headway uh, first you need to uh, uh, calculate what is called a non interference headway. Non interference headway is uh, very simple it is just the addition of uh, 3 different times the train control separation time which you just calculated average dwelling time for uh, at control stations uh, again standard values that will be given uh, and operating margins operating margins again will be given. So, this is something that you just calculated. So, you see these are imported inputs that means imported from the calculation that you have already done and you just add these 3 to get this value. So, that is non interference headway the second headway that you need to calculate is the minimum headway with respect to right of way type right if it is a uh, excluded exclusive right of way single track on street private right of way or grade separated. So, 4 different types of right of ways will have different capacities remember if it is a grade separated private right of way that has the highest capacity whereas, if it is on street it is mingling with other type types of vehicles it has a lower capacity. So, all of that will depend upon again there are a bunch of inputs that you could go through and uh, finally, what calculations you have to do is first you have to uh, determine the time to cover single track station uh, minimum single track headway 
minimum on street section that will give you the non interference headway associated with stations at uh, with uh, grade crossings at on departure and finally, minimum headway associated with right of way type which is the nothing but the maximum of HST that you have already calculated HOS here and HGC here. So, out of these three whichever is the maximum that will be the minimum headway associated with the right of way type. Okay. Again do not get carried away by the length and complexity of the formulas all input parameters have already been given to you just input those parameters into the formula. What you need to understand is what each of the type each of the elements in the formulas talk about right. You have to know what is TIJ, you have to know what is TBR and why they are affecting the calculation of controlling headway, why they are affecting that if you understand that and that should be easy to understand. Uh, finally, you have to calculate the limiting headway. Uh, the next the third type of headway that you need to calculate is the limiting headway and the limiting headway uh, uh, at the junction uh, is calculated by uh, this formula right here. You already have most of the input parameters that you have calculated in the, in the previous ones. The only inputs that you will need here is the track separation uh, feet, how much your track separation uh, uh, right of way is separated from the uh, uh, from the grade uh, it is at grade or not at grade and then uh, the switch throw and lock time these are again standard values that will be given to you uh, in a table in a tab tabular fashion or uh, uh, or you uh, they are standard in a, in a book uh, that has the, all the standards all you need to do is look for the right value. So, that is what uh, you have to do calculations switch angle factor again is something that you have to be uh, looking for these are again standard values you input all of these values in this formula and you get the limiting headway. So, now the controlling headway is the maximum of these three headways that you have just calculated see imported inputs you have calculated the non interference headway you have calculated the headway imposed by right of way types and you have calculated the highest uh, limiting headway at a junction. The maximum value among these three will be your controlling headway. So, once you know the controlling headway or the headway value is 376, you have calculated the controlling headway now you can go ahead and calculate the line capacity and the personal capacity, a person capacity. In order to do so, first you have to determine whether there is any layover time at the terminal, that layover time at the terminal it should be less than or equal to this entire formula. Again all of these are input values that are either given here or already has been given earlier in solving these problems input this if it is not less than or equal to that then um, uh, then use the value that you get here. It has to be at least less than or equal to the uh, right hand side value. So, that is what the terminal layover time is telling you if calculations shows that the terminal layover time is 178 here with that terminal layover time uh, and controlling headway that you have already, capa uh, already calculated the line capacity is given by this formula and the person capacity is given by this formula. You already know the line capacity, number of trains per car, maximum design load, number of persons per car and the peak hour factor. If you know all of that, the person capacity is 1. So, your transit line can carry 8640 persons per hour <coughs> and this one uh, if you have uh, use different way if you have uh, used for a different control system. So, this is a parallel you know remember the different control systems that we were talking about if there is a different type of a control system uh, that you have uh, um, carried out all these calculations for the capacity would be different. So, basically it depends upon which type of control system you are using for the train uh, it will tell you what capacity your train is running at, what the headway between the trains are, what is the controlling headway meaning which is the maximum of the three headways uh, that headway will also uh, control which how much is the capacity of your transit line. So, this is the reference that we were talking about uh, and all of these examples are solved in that uh, reference. So, please look at it uh, carefully the uh, calculations may seem complex, but they are not at all they are empirical formulas input values will be always given to you standardized values will be available in standard tables all you need to do is pick the right value from the tables and pick the correct um, formula 
for calculating these values. So, in conclusion, we have explained to you uh, in detail how to ca how to calculate the capacity of your bus transit line and also your capacity of your uh, transit uh, rail transit line. Uh, what those capacities depend upon? Uh, bus capacity maybe depends upon your loading areas. A number of loading, uh, not only number of loading areas, but also loading area capacity, which may in turn depend upon the dwell time. Similarly, in case of transit, uh, rail transit, you saw that the headway, the controlling headway is something that will affect your uh, um, uh, line capacity as well as person capacity. So, understanding these, uh, 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 these terminologies and these factors is very in, uh, important in determining the uh, line capacity, uh, determine the capacities of your bus and transit line. Thank you very much for your attention.